Supreme Court. I'm preaching on it now because the media has been reporting lately that both political parties, both of the main political parties, may be too extreme on abortion. That many Americans, liberal and conservative, are actually moderates on this issue. And that's really interesting. I'm preaching on it now because religious voices speak out against abortion all the time, trying to make it illegal, and I have a different view. And it's important for there to be another faith-based perspective out there, especially when big changes are underway. And I'm preaching on it because almost everyone here either has had an abortion or knows and loves someone who did, statistically speaking. You may not know that you know someone who had one, but statistically, you probably do. And so it's not right that abortion should so often be cloaked in secrecy and stigma. Whenever we talk about it openly, it helps us to put it in a proper perspective. We're better equipped as voters when we know more. When we know more, we are better equipped as spiritual people who take in-depth and nuanced views of things, and who don't take religious liberty or the sacredness of life lightly. When we know more, we are better equipped as people who may one day face an unplanned pregnancy of our own or of a family member or friend. And when we know more, we are better equipped for whatever happens next legally and socially. Because no matter what happens next legally, one thing is for sure there will still be abortions. They just might not be very safe. According to the Guttmacher Institute, by the age of 45, nearly one in four women will have had an abortion. I searched but could not find Guttmacher's definition of women. I would guess that in the context of their study, it probably refers to people who have wombs, whether or not they identify as women and whether or not they are fertile. That would still leave some women out. But the statistic is still striking. Nearly one in four, 23.7%. I am one of those women. As I shared in the sermon back in 2013, I have had an abortion. At the time, I didn't tell anybody except for my parents and my boyfriend. I knew that if I did, I would be shamed and ostracized in my small town. In fact, I never told more than a few people until 2013 when I said it in a sermon to about 350 people, and it took all of my courage to say it then. I was 16 years old when I had an abortion. My mom and my sister and I were already on welfare, and our family life was unstable. I moved about eight times in three years back then. I was a junior in high school. When I began to suspect that I might be pregnant, I went to a pregnancy crisis center. I found it in the phone book. It wasn't until the test came back positive and the woman there began telling me how awful and dangerous abortion is, that it would be excruciating and would cause infertility and cancer, that I realized I was dealing with an anti-abortion group, not just a pregnancy crisis center. Like many women, I had been tricked by the name. I knew enough to know that what she was telling me was not true, I listened politely and then said, thanks, I think I'll have an abortion. <laughs> and I left. I did not like being tricked that way. But the truth was, I didn't feel as sure as that. Although I had been raised Unitarian Universalist and our denomination has long supported the right to safe and legal abortion, and although I considered myself a liberal person and a feminist, I felt really conflicted about the idea of having one. Once I knew I was pregnant, I felt like something really sacred was happening. I imagined the child I might have vividly, and my heart was moved. I felt a connection. I knew I wanted to be a mom someday. I had always known that, my whole life, even when I was just a little kid myself. But I also knew I did not have much support. It was important to me to be a really good mother, and I knew I was not ready yet. I imagined what it would be like to continue the pregnancy and give a baby up for adoption. Would I be able to do something like that? 
I talked with my doctor about what she knew about these things. And I decided not to continue the pregnancy. On the day of my appointment for an abortion, I waited for my boyfriend to pick me up. We had planned for him to take me and to share the cost, since he was responsible for this pregnancy too. Instead, he stood me up without a word. I got a ride from my mother. I was lucky the clinic was only an hour away. And no, he never paid. The role of men in unplanned pregnancies and the lack of any reference to them in abortion legislation is probably a whole other sermon. <laughs> Could you imagine if anti-abortion legislation charged men with reckless endangerment of a child for impregnating a woman who did not want to be pregnant? Law professors Michelle Oberman and David Ball say there are legal grounds for that. It's just not where our overwhelmingly male conservative legislators choose to put their attention. But I digress. Although it took me a while to sort out my feelings about my decision, I have never regretted it. I'm so grateful that I was able to decide to wait to become a mother. And it has made all the difference in my life. It's different talking about abortion when we don't think we know someone who has had one than when we do. When my daughter was in about eighth grade, she came home from school one day and she told me she thought she was against abortion. She said it just like that. I think I'm against abortion. So I asked her about her concerns and she explained them. I affirmed that they were valid. It's a complex issue for sure, I told her. I told her that several women we knew had had abortions. And then I told her who they are. They're kind, responsible women whom she loves, and they love her. Neighbors, friends, relatives, and me. Now, I don't think that telling her that took away her concerns. That's not what I was trying to do. But she did realize that there must be much more to the issue than it had seemed at first. For as long as recorded history, and longer, women have used abortion to control their reproduction, their health, and their lives. Where safe, legal abortion is not available, the methods women use are a testament to the desperation a woman may feel when faced with an unplanned pregnancy. Some are mild, taking certain herbs or trying strenuous exercise, for example. But when those kinds of attempts don't work, other options are dangerous and painful. Hot water poured on the abdomen, being punched or kicked or thrown down the stairs, ingesting poison, trying to open the womb with sharp objects. Women have done all of these things and more. They've crossed international borders to get abortions. They've risked injury, infertility, exile, going to jail, hemorrhage, infection, and death. These facts should make it obvious to all of us that an unplanned pregnancy is not merely an inconvenience. It's not analogous to a medical procedure or a period of illness. It's not like donating blood or even an organ, which we would never force someone to do. No, it's something that's so life-altering that when a woman needs an abortion, she may go to almost any length to get one. Consider this fact. The same number of abortions take place in countries where abortion is heavily restricted as in countries where abortion is broadly legal. The same number of abortions take place in both. But where abortion is heavily restricted, more women are injured or die from them. Since 1973, in the US, safe legal abortion has been available to almost any woman who can get to a clinic and pay the cost. Since that same time, though, anti-abortion legislation has placed restrictions on access, waiting periods, mandatory parental consent, preventing federal funds from covering abortion, including the insurance provided to federal workers and their families. That's what the Hyde Amendment is about. We've heard that in the news recently. It prevents women who work for the government and their daughters from having insurance coverage for abortion unless they can somehow prove the pregnancy was caused by rape. Then there's a whole category of abortion restrictions called trap laws. Trap 
stands for Targeted Regulation of Abortion Providers. And these are laws that make it difficult or impossible for providers and clinics to stay in business, but they don't increase patient safety. Forcing doctors to have an admitting privilege at nearby hospitals, even though it's not necessary, and even if the hospitals are religious hospitals and will not grant that permission, that's one example of a trap law. Forcing abortion clinics to be located near hospitals or away from schools is another one. For decades, anti-abortion activists and politicians have put up these barriers to the point that 90% of U.S. counties do not have an abortion provider. And there are six states that have only one abortion clinic in the entire state. The lone clinic in Missouri has a court date coming up in August that might shut that clinic down, which would make Missouri the first state in 45 years to not have a single clinic that provides abortions. But more states might follow. We're now at a point where states are passing increasingly restrictive bans, and Alabama has passed a law banning all abortions except when the mother's life is at risk. There is no exception for rape, not even of a minor. The law was challenged in court before it could go into effect, of course, and as its sponsors hoped, it is probably headed for that newly conservative Supreme Court. <coughs> now, as I mentioned at the start, there's some conversation happening in the media about whether the Democrat and Republican parties are in step with their members when it comes to this issue. It's especially relevant as the presidential primaries ramp up. The General Social Survey is a research product project that's run out of the University of Chicago. It has tracked public opinion and feelings about lots of important issues, including abortion, since the 1970s. The General Social Survey reports that 40% of Democrats oppose allowing access to abortion for any reason, meaning they might support it in certain cases, but they think there should be restrictions. 40%. And meanwhile, 29% of Republicans support allowing access to abortion for any reason. Surprised? Yeah. At the same time, statistics really depend on how you ask the question. Sometimes the same respondents will give contradictory answers in one poll. For example, when asked whether they support abortion in the first trimester, 60% of Americans say yes, they do. That's a politically mixed group. I'm not just talking about one political party. 60% say they support access to abortion in the first trimester. But when the question is modified to say, to ask whether they support abortion in the first trimester when the woman does not want the child for any reason, that same group responds differently, and then only 45% say they support it. This happens with other questions, too. When the wording is changed, the same group will give different answers referring to abortion as a choice a woman has, for example, seems to be less acceptable to some groups than speaking of it as a decision that a woman might make. I think probably decision carries a connotation of discernment and thoughtfulness, while choice could sound a little bit cavalier. Once I saw a Spanish language abortion rights video um, in which a team took to the streets asking questions on camera. It took place in a Latin American country, and I can't remember which one it was now. But I remember the questions. They asked passersby whether they believed abortion should be legal. And to those who did not believe it should be legal, interviewers asked whether they knew anybody who had had an abortion. And when many of the respondents said yes, the interviewer then asked whether they thought that person should be arrested. And that gave everybody pause. Nuance. The New York Times reporter Nate Cohn writes, it's hard to reconcile it all. Many analysts or activists have tried, often in ways that show that their own views command majority support. But the most straightforward interpretation may be that the polls aren't clear, because for most Americans, abortion is a difficult, even wrenching issue that they can't resolve for themselves. <laughs> Let alone, let alone for the country. The thing is, when you need one, you need one. In this common secret, Susan Wickland, who's a doctor, 
describes providing abortions to people that she recognized from the anti-abortion picket lines outside of her clinic. Those protesters just didn't know what they didn't know until they found themselves in that position of need. Important life decisions are rarely black and white. Decisions about reproduction are always part of the context and the demands of a person's life. They are often morally complex. Moral complexity is not bad. It reflects the realities of our life. What I know as a mother and as a minister is that the decision to become a parent is one of the most profound, sacred decisions a person will make in their lifetime. When I found out I was pregnant again a couple of years after I'd had an abortion, I was still very young. But I was finished with high school, and I was in a better situation. I chose to become a mother then. I was lucky to have a supportive and trustworthy partner that time, and we are still together 24 years later. And our daughter and her little brother who followed are now grown. Because I had options in each case, my family has had a good life, and I'm here telling the story. As a Unitarian Universalist minister, I believe that a human life is a sacred gift, and that because of that, we should not force a woman to continue a pregnancy against her will. To do so is to disregard her life, and sometimes it would compromise the lives of her other children as well. I also believe that a tiny potential human is also a sacred thing. But for one to mature to full personhood and be born, that is a gift. It cannot be forced without violating the sacredness of parenthood or of life. I believe that because each situation is different, instead of interfering with the blunt instrument of law, we should ask ourselves how we can respect and support a person who must make the life-altering decision about whether to have a child. And because each woman's situation is different, I believe we must protect her ability to make her own decision in consultation with those she trusts and with her own faith and conscience. As a UU minister, religious liberty is really important to me. The free and responsible search for truth and meaning that is one of our core principles. We believe in respect for religious diversity. A woman and the people she trusts to advise her need to be able to follow their own faith beliefs about whether to end a pregnancy. Her options in such a private, huge matter should not be dictated by strangers of another religion or another denomination or by politicians who don't know her life. I believe we can have complex views and even grave concerns about abortion, and we can still understand the statistics and agree that the best thing for women's safety and for religious liberty and for compassion toward those facing situations we cannot imagine is for abortion to be broadly legal, safe, and accessible. And I believe that whether we are okay with the idea of abortion or whether we are deeply uncomfortable with it, we can share a goal of making abortion less necessary. To honor the sacredness of life, we should make sure people of all genders have unfettered access to good quality contraception and comprehensive sex education. To honor the sacredness of life, we should end poverty. We should create social conditions in which a woman does not have to choose abortion because she doesn't have health insurance or enough food to provide and in which a woman does not have to choose abortion because she has no parental leave at her job and cannot afford to be fired. To honor the sacredness of life, we should understand choice as more than a yes or no about abortion. Honoring the sacredness of life takes into account the wider circumstances of our lives, working for a world where most pregnancies are planned and where all who find themselves pregnant can have confidence that if born, their child will have a good life with health care, a clean environment, good education, healthy food, love, and a place at the table in our economy. May that be so. Amen. <laughs>